Thank you. You may be seated. Now, as you're getting settled in and a little more comfortable, I have a Christmas present. But it's only a Christmas present for some of you. There are two requirements for you to have received this Christmas present. Number one, you have to have attended the 75th anniversary weekend celebration. And number two, you have to have had your picture taken at the 75th anniversary celebration because the number of directories that were sent to us is based on the number of people who had their picture taken for inclusion in the directory. These are what they look like. They're beautiful. And uh, inside, you'll find nice pictures of all the folks who attended. And that was the basis for which they made the number of directories. We've got a front page here with all the people who participated in it. And then we have a number of very interesting pages that have photographs of the banquet and the, the quartet and the people who made presentations at the banquet and Bible Presbyterian Church through the years and so on. So don't try to snitch one. They've got people's names on them. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> at the top, here in the left, there's a, a name printed with your name. But if you were there and if you had your picture taken, uh, you or your family, will get a copy of the directory. Beautifully done. Uh, I thank my daughter Megaly for having been the one who coordinated this. And uh, as you know, after Judy died, things became rather chaotic. So it took us a little longer to get these things finished. But praise the Lord, they got here in time for Christmas. Came in just a few days ago. And uh, afterward, come up and see me, and you will get your copy of this. This one is Bob and Barbara Bancroft's coffee. Not coffee, copy. <laughs> All right, let's take our Bibles and turn back to that portion of Scripture that we read just a few moments ago out of the book of John, the Gospel of John, John chapter 1. The theological declaration of what Christmas is all about when John declares to us that the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. A marvelous and fantastic statement of who Jesus Christ is. We beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The birth of Christ is not merely a, a very exciting event for a mother and a stepdad. The birth of our Lord Jesus Christ is not merely something that the family and the relatives can all be happy about that a baby is safely born. Many of you have, well, all of you have been through it at least once you were born, but uh, <laughs> some of you are also parents and grandparents, and you know what joy there is in a family when a new child comes into the world. What a joy and delight, even after the labor and delivery, the trauma of childbirth. And as you know, Judy went through that 13 times. I was there at every occasion. and. Um, it's a painful, difficult time. But there was incredible joy in the birth of each of our children. When the Lord Jesus Christ was born, there was joy not only on earth, but there was joy in heaven. There was joy in eternity. There was an incredible sense of awe as the angelic host not only announced to the shepherds in the field, there was an incredible sense of awe that God himself would take on human flesh and be born into this world. God's plan for redemption was about to unfold in human history. He had promised it all the way back in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, where he promised that the seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent, the Proto-Evangelium. And now we see God working in history as he brought that about. When we think of Christmas, we think of gifts. But... Now, sadly, buying gifts has gone to a whole new level of craziness. All I have to do is say two words. Black Friday. You heard those, right? Black Friday. How many of you camped out overnight or got up at zero dark 30 to join the madness? <laughs> Some did. I know they did. <laughs> Was it really worth it? 
And yet, you know, for some strange reason, even the world thinks that gifts are part of the DNA of Christmas. But seriously, you also have to prioritize your gift giving, don't you? The ones you love most are the ones to whom you give your greatest gifts. That's what God did for us. The proof of God prioritizing with those whom he loves is that he gave us his greatest gift at Christmas. I mean, you don't put the same amount of care in choosing an anonymous gift for an office party that you put into a gift for your mother or your dad, right? You would think that the more important a person is to you, the more you care to put into their gift. Remember that when you think about God's gift to us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Paul says that Jesus is a gift too wonderful for words. Paul was not only brilliant, but he was eloquent. But when it came to the gift of God, he gave us all in the person of Christ he could only throw up his hands and say, thanks be to God for his unspeakable gift. Well, that's a gift that's too wonderful for words. That's 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 15. You know, with that, we could preach a whole series of sermons. But I think this morning, I want us to think about the incarnation of God and how that, that should affect the gifts that we give unto him. What gift are you going to give to the Lord as we conclude the Christmas season and head into the new year? What gift will you give to him, the one who gave you his very best? Since he gave you his best, shouldn't you give him your very best as well? So to think along those lines, I'd like for us to think for a moment about the wise men and see how they responded to this gift that we see in John chapter 1. Why did they come? We all know the story. We know that they were not kings, as in we three kings of Orient are. They were wise men, or magi, of the priestly class who were king makers in Persia. We know that they were not there at the birth of Jesus, as many of the Christmas plays and the manger scenes have it. They came months later, based on the Greek word for child in Matthew chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. He wasn't a newborn at that point. He was a young child. And it, it would have taken a lot of time to have traveled from Persia all the way to Jerusalem and then from Jerusalem down to Bethlehem. We know that they brought at least three kinds of gifts. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. We know what they brought and we know why they came. It tells us, as they speak to Herod, they say, we are come to worship him. We are come to worship him. Worship is what you give to God. The message today is entitled, God Incarnate. We have a magnificent, wonderful truth in the incarnation of God. We are come to worship him. Why did you come to church today? Oh, well, it's Christmas, or, oh, well, it's traditional, or, well, you know, it's a habit. My mom and dad got me into it when I was a little kid, and so I show up every week. I come to church so that I won't have a guilty conscience, or I come to church because it makes me look good with the rest of those people that I think of as my friends. Why did you come to church today? The wise men said we are come to worship him. You know, there's a lot we know about the wise men and a lot we don't know about the wise men. We know that there were three kinds of gifts, but we don't know exactly sure how many there were of the wise men. I suspect, and my dad has done an entire study on this, and I encourage you to get his book on it, but um, the, since these were the kingmakers of Persia, they were not traveling alone on camels, which was a lowly beast. They were probably traveling on beautiful stallions and surrounded by a host of military to protect them on that very long journey from Persia to Jerusalem. We're just not told how many there were. We're simply told how many gifts or how many different types of gifts that there were. They came from Persia, which is modern-day Iraq or Iran. 
That was the area that they came from. Think of what's going on over there today. They would have had knowledge if they came from there of Daniel the prophet because Daniel was exiled in Babylon. In Babylon he would have served as an advisor under the kings of Babylon and Persia. You recall that Daniel, if you read the book of Daniel, transitions between those two kingdoms, the kingdom of Babylon and the kingdom of Persia. They may have heard about some of those prophecies. In fact, after Daniel interpreted King Nebuchadnezzar's dream in Daniel chapter 2, verse 48, it tells us that the king made Daniel ruler over the entire province of Babylon and placed him in charge of all of its wise men. Daniel would probably have taught the wise men the prophecies that God gave to him. And it was Daniel who was given a prophecy concerning the coming Messiah, a ruler, in Daniel chapter 9, verse 25, a prophecy that looks forward to the Lord Jesus Christ. But you know there was an even earlier prophecy than that. It's the prophecy of Balaam in Numbers chapter 24, verse 17. Balaam was what we might call an internationally known prophet, a seer, who came from the valley of the Euphrates, which became the Babylonian Persian Empire, now Iran and Iraq. So it's possible that the Magi would, Magi would have been privy to at least two of those prophecies, like Daniel's prophecy. Balaam prophesied and spoke about a coming ruler, and his prophecy in Numbers 24, 17 says, A star will come out of Jacob, a scepter shall arise out of Israel. So there were several prophecies that these wise men may have heard when they saw the phenomena of the star. What is that star? Well, there's a, a connection clearly in both Daniel's prophecies and in Balaam's prophecies that a a star and a coming ruler for Israel, for Judah, would arise and somehow those Magi, and you think about this for a second because it was not only Daniel who was among the children of the captivity who were placed in positions of authority in Babylon. There was Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, known as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the three children in the fiery furnace who were also in Babylon. The Jews had been carried captive there. The the brightest and smartest of them had been placed in the king's direct service and so no doubt a good number of them were also within that class of kingmakers, the wise men of Persia, the great ones, the Magi. But what was it that caused them to understand the connection between what they saw and the nation of Israel? You know, there was a popular belief cited by several ancient historians that stars, comets, and other astral phenomena heralded the births of people destined for greatness. Just a few references. Pliny mentions that. Lucian mentions that. Tacitus in his Annals of the World mentions that. Suetonius mentions that. And that was a, a common theory back then that, oh, some kind of an astral phenomena would signify the arising of a great ruler. Those magi knew that this was a star that related specifically to Jesus, not just some great ruler was going to be born. Because they said, we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. Several Roman historians record that there was a lot of speculation during that time about a world ruler who had come from an eastern province which could include Judea. Josephus in his Wars of the Jews, Suetonius in Vespasian, Tacitus in his histories, all make mention of that. So these wise men figured that this particular star, though, would lead them to the one of whom the prophets spoke. It wasn't just a general feeling in the culture, but they knew it was a specific manifestation that would lead them to the promised Messiah. How would they have known that? How would they have known that this was the one of whom the prophets spoke? Well, of course, you've got the Balaam prophecy. Jacob and Judah are mentioned there in that prophecy. But they still had to get to Jesus, one tiny infant nearly a thousand miles away. 
How would you like to go out and see some kind of a conjunction in the sky and say, well, I know the general vicinity uh, down, say, um, in Atlanta, Georgia. So I'm going to head for Atlanta, Georgia from here, and uh, I'm going to get down there and I'm going to hunt around till I find a brand new baby that I know for sure, that I know for sure is the baby that that thing I see up in the sky represents. Folks, you realize we have some supernatural things going on here. It's not a natural event. It's not a general consensus event. It's not a public opinion event. It's not a popular thing that everybody sort of believes in. That star pointed to one specific baby in one specific location. And it was at least several months after the birth when they got there. How would you like to go and try to check all the hospital records in Atlanta, Georgia, to find what babies were born on a specific date. And back then they didn't have hospital records to tell you when a baby had born on a specific date to make sure you found exactly the right child. God makes no mistakes. God was able in his sovereignty to give a very special kind of direction. The text tells us about that here. I mean, some people think it was just a natural occurrence. I mean, for example, in 7 BC, the planets Saturn and Jupiter converged and shone as one light for a period of several months. Some people think it was a supernova. But you know, the text doesn't say that. John gave us a hint in that passage we read here just a few moments ago. It says that the Lord Jesus Christ was born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And listen to this next phrase. And we beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. His glory. Very interesting word there. That takes us back to the Old Testament, to the wilderness wanderings of the children of Israel, for a very special presentation of the glory of God, which is called the Shekinah, Shekinah, the dwelling place, the Shekinah glory of God appears. And what does it do? It tells them that God himself is dwelling in the midst of his people. And the Shekinah glory of God appeared as a pillar of fire by night and a pillar of cloud by the day. And it rested over the place where God was dwelling over the mercy seat in the tabernacle in the wilderness to show that God was present in his people and it was there that once a year the great high priest would come in and sprinkle blood on the mercy seat between the two cherubim to make an atonement for the sins of the people and the people in the camp all around could see the Shekinah they could see the glory of God and they knew specifically where God's glory was resting John says, we beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. You see, when you read the Matthew narrative of the birth of Christ, they not only saw the star in the east, but they came to Jerusalem. That's where you would expect first to find the great king. The king rules from Jerusalem. And they came into Herod, and they say, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east, and are come to worship him. Now when they showed up on the rise, and it says Herod was troubled, and all the city of Jerusalem. Three guys on a camel would not have troubled the city of Jerusalem. But if you see the Persian army at the gates of Jerusalem, you may be in trouble. And so Herod treats them with kid gloves. In fact, he calls the scribes and the Pharisees together and says, where is this baby supposed to be born? And they say, well, Isaiah says, in Bethlehem of Judea, for thou, Bethlehem in the land of Judah, art not the least of the thousands of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Micah, not Isaiah, from the book of Micah. So Herod says, ah, it's Bethlehem. Uh, and by the way, when you find him, send me word that I can come and worship him also. Herod would never have said that to three guys on camels. But if he saw an army around his city, he would definitely have said that. He didn't go down with them. He wasn't about to move out of Bethlehem. He was always afraid that somebody was about to assassinate him. 
In fact, anybody who even made a pretense at taking Herod's throne, he killed his family members whom he thought might try to take his throne away from him. But he treats the Magi with kid gloves. And then it says, the Magi went out, and it says, the star which they had seen in the east went before them until it came and stood over the place where the young child lay. Now, folks, a conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn in the constellation of Pisces doesn't mark out anything except perhaps you go in that general direction. It won't mark out a city. It won't mark out a place. It won't mark out a house. But the Shekinah glory says it went before them. That's a very special word. It's the word that is used when Jesus is walking back to Jerusalem and he's going to be crucified and his disciples are dragging along behind him and Thomas says well we might as well go with him because you know we can die with him at least you know Thomas the doubter and the one who's always the negative guy it says he went before them that's the word that used the star which they saw in the east went before them until it came and stood over the place where the young child lay What did the Shekinah glory of God do in the Old Testament? It stood over the place where God made his connection with men. It stood over the mercy seat, the Hilasterion. That's the word that's used for Jesus. Where in the book of Hebrews it says, He is our mercy seat, He is our Hilasterion, He's the one where the blood is shed to make atonement for the sins of his people. It was the Shekinah glory of God, I'm convinced beyond shadow of a doubt, because it went before them, it led them through the wilderness just like it led the children of Israel through the wilderness, down the road as they traveled down the road, until it came and stood. It made a stop in the Old Testament when the children of Israel were ready to move, they didn't move until the Shekinah moved. When the Shekinah lifted up and went before them, the whole camp packed up and it moved until it stopped. And then they camped there at that place for however long God wanted them to camp. The Shekinah glory stayed there and they didn't move. And then when it got up and moved again, they moved again. That's what the Shekinah glory did. It led them specifically to the place where the young child lay. Friends, that's exciting. God intersecting with history the word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory the glory as of the only begotten of the father full of grace and truth that's the glory the same glory of God in heaven that is the glory that passed by Moses in the cleft of the rock that's the same glory that filled the tabernacle in the first temple the same glory that shone around the shepherds in Luke chapter 2 the heavenly glory appeared and moved that was the star that led the wise men directly to the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, you've all heard that phrase, wise men still seek him. But why did they seek him? They sought him to worship him. You know, they had to be persevering, have some perseverance to do that. It wasn't easy. It wasn't convenient for them to worship him. They had a lot of obstacles to overcome. Do you overcome your obstacles so you can be here every week to worship him? There was a distance, for example. Some of you come a long distance. Think about the distance they came. They came all the way from Persia, modern Iraq, to Jerusalem. Even today, that's a long trip. Even today, that's a long trip with modern transportation. If you're doing a ground trip from Persia to Jerusalem, think about that. Even today, with automobiles and all that kind of stuff. And the dangers that are out there, the distance... They came a minimum of 700 miles. That's how far it is from Babylon to Jerusalem. If they came from a different place rather than Babylon itself, they would have traveled more than 700 miles. The difficulty. Not only was there obstacle of distance, there was the obstacle of difficulty. There were no trains, planes, automobiles. They were restricted to horses and perhaps some of the baggage burden bearing beasts that came along with them. 
Think about braving the elements. Think about getting food in a day when there were no McDonald's hamburgers, no Wendy's, no grocery stores that you could stop into and whip up something to cook for yourself. Try traveling 700 miles like that. There was a danger. Not just danger of the highway, not just danger from robbers, three lone guys traveling with that kind of gifts would have been perfect target for bandits. Now they were traveling with an army, but there was danger because they were traveling across hostile territory too. And of course there was danger from Herod who was suspicious and paranoid and a murderer. If he got even the idea of a threat to his throne, he would have you killed. He killed many of his family members. In fact, we read later in the Gospel of Matthew where he ended up ordering the death of all the male children two years old and younger in Bethlehem and in the surrounding region. Matthew chapter 2 verses 16 and 17. He was a hateful and murderous old man. There was danger. But you see, they had a very important quest. They were on their way to worship Jesus. Let's compare that to our attitude toward worship today. You know, many people have an attitude uh, toward worshiping the Lord Jesus that's sort of a take-it-or-leave-it kind of an attitude. They come to church when they feel like it. They come if it won't get in the way of something else or if they don't have something else to do. They come late. They worship when it's convenient or fits their schedule. They who worship when there's not anything more important or more pressing or more exciting to do. I mean, if the weather's not right or the company comes or if there's something else to do, great show on TV, they don't seem to be able to make it to worship. Well, you know, these wise men, these magi, they were serious about worship. They were driven by one goal. They were obsessed with one objective. You see, the true and living God had made an intersection with history. They were propelled by a passion that was to find Jesus and to worship him. In spite of the distance, in spite of the difficulty, in spite of the danger, they came to worship him. Is that what propelled you to come this morning? That's what we should be doing. We've talked about why they came to worship him. Let's talk about what they brought. We all know that when they worshiped the Lord Jesus, they brought him those three very special gifts. Those were gifts that were well chosen and appropriate, divinely ordained as a matter of fact. You know, it's hard to find the right gifts at Christmas time, isn't it? I buy Christmas gifts all year long. <laughs> Whenever there's a sale. I have uh, 13 children, seven of them are married, so you add seven to that, that's 20. And then I got 15 grandchildren and two more on the way, that's 32. Uh, and then I got a brother and a sister, and they've got some kids that uh, I still give Christmas presents to. And I've got an uncle that I give a Christmas present to. And you know, you start counting that up, it takes me all year to find Christmas gifts that are right for these people that I can afford. <laughs> so, but every one is thought through, very carefully thought through. Tough to find the right gifts at Christmas. Some people in our lives take a lot of extra thought a lot of extra effort, a lot of expense when getting just the right gift for them. You try to find something that fits the person's style or their personality or to meet some particular need and sometimes that's difficult. Now some people give gifts just trying to be mean. You've all gotten those gag gifts. Uh, one Christmas, one of my sons, I'll not tell you who it is but you all know him, <laughs> and he's one of the ones who's still single, <laughs> so that narrows it down, gave me I don't know where he bought this, but it was a whole big pack like this, and they were all attached together. You could pull them off one at a time, of toothbrushes. <laughs> I don't know what he's trying to hit at, but he said, it's a gag, Dad, it's a gag. <laughs> we, we give, sometimes we give gag gifts, but you know, the wise men didn't bring any gag gifts. What they brought was appropriate, exactly right. What would you bring if you were bringing a gift to a newly born king. What would be fitting and what would be appropriate for the Messiah? Well, the gifts the wise men chose were especially fitting because they are symbolic of some wonderful truths that are revealed to us in Scripture about the Lord Jesus Christ. And they tell us what we ought to bring to Jesus during this Christmas season. Let's think about the gifts that they and what they represent. The first gift that's mentioned is gold. 
gold. Gold you clearly would bring to a king. When they opened up their treasures and presented him gifts, they presented with gold. Now gold was the most precious metal of that day. And in Bible times, it was always a symbol of royalty. Solomon covered his throne in gold. We've seen the elaborate and lavish use of gold in the tombs of the Egyptian kings. Those of you who have been with us on Wednesday evening when we've been down in Egypt and seen all those uh, monuments and so on as we've studied the Exodus, the children of Israel coming out of Egypt. Those tombs were covered with gold. You think of the royal sarcophagus, three sarcophagi inside each other of King, King Tutankhamun, covered with gold. Gold was fitting for a king. It was a gift for a ruler, for a monarch. So when these wise men came to the humble home of Joseph and Mary, they presented him with gold. What they were saying is, this child will be a king. They had studied the ancient prophecies of Daniel. They'd followed the star of Balaam's prophecy. They came asking Herod, where is the one who's born king of the Jews? They heard the prophecy of Micah 5, 2 from the scribes and Pharisees as they were standing there near Herod. They brought him gold. They recognized his sovereign dominion. Have you done that this morning? Have you recognized his sovereign dominion, his right to reign and to rule as king? Isaiah 9, 7 says, Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. He's going to be the king who reigns on David's throne over his kingdom, establishing and under, uh, upholding with judgment and justice forevermore. You see, the baby we're talking about was no ordinary baby. The book of Revelation tells us that he's king of kings. It tells us that he's lord of lords. Now the question comes this Christmas, will you offer to the Lord the submission due to him because he is your king? You see, it's not enough just to tip your hat. You have to bow your knee. When the wise men came, they weren't just following a fad. They were serious in their worship of Jesus. When the wise men came to see Jesus, they didn't cuddle him. They didn't coo at him. They bowed before him and recognized him first and foremost of all that he was king. Have you done that? What can I give him today? Well, the first gift of the wise men tells us what we can do. We can give him our wealth. We can recognize his sovereign dominion over all that we have. Not just 10%, 100%. We are merely stewards and not owners of what God has entrusted to us. Are we using the stewardship that he's given to us the way that he, as the king, wants it to be used. He is the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. His kingdom has no end. As far as your life is concerned, either he is Lord of all or he is not Lord at all. Have you given him your wealth? Have you said, Jesus, you are my King and my Lord. I place all that I have under your sovereign dominion to be used as you want it to be used. If so, as you are choosing a Christmas gift for Jesus, let me suggest that one of the things that you might offer him is your gold, your money. Bring what he has entrusted to you to support the outreach of the good news of Jesus Christ to those who have never heard. Give him your gold. Give him your best. The second gift that was brought was frankincense. Frankincense gives us a very clear statement concerning the deity of our Lord Jesus Christ in Scripture. What was frankincense? What did it symbolize? Frankincense is a very expensive incense made from the rosin of a certain tree, which when it is cut, bleeds an amber-colored oil. When you catch that and dry that, then you can warm it or burn it, and it releases a fragrant scent that fills the room with the most delicious aroma. What did it symbolize? If gold symbolized his sovereign dominion, then frankincense symbolizes his supreme deity. Listen to Exodus chapter 30, verses 34 through 37. Frankincense is a gift befitting Almighty God, according to Exodus. It was an extremely significant gift, not an afterthought. And the Lord said unto Moses, Take pure frankincense with these sweet spices. There shall be equal amounts of each. You shall make of these an incense 
a compound according to the art of the apothecary, salted, pure, and holy. And you shall beat some of it very fine and put some of it before the testimony in the tabernacle of meeting where I will meet with you. That is before the Ark of the Covenant. Remember the altar of incense that was in there? It shall be most holy to you. But as for the incense which you shall make, you shall not make any for yourselves according to its composition. It shall be to you holy for the Lord. Exodus 30, verses 34 through 37. Frankincense was the principal part of that compound which was offered on the altar of incense which those of you who have been with us in our study of the tabernacles knows that that is a, a picture of the prayers of the saints ascending up before God and we're told that in the book of Revelation. Jesus Christ is God. Very God of very God as the old creeds would say. These wise men recognized this not only by what they gave but by what they did. They came and they worshipped him. That was the statement of their purpose in verse 2 of Matthew chapter 2, and that was what they did in verse 11. They bowed down and worshipped him. Frankincense speaks of worship of the true living God of Israel. The Greek word means to prostrate yourself here when they worship him, to bow down, to fall flat on your face. The wise men followed the star to that humble home. They came in and when they saw the child, it says they bowed down and they worshipped him. They saw the child with his mother, but they didn't worship her. Those who worship Mary have got it wrong. It says they fell down and worshipped him. They didn't worship Joseph. They didn't worship Mary. They didn't worship a bunch of saints. They worshipped Jesus. Because Jesus is God come in the flesh. They didn't bow before Herod, and Herod was a king. They didn't worship Herod, and Herod was a king. No, they bowed down and worshipped Jesus. Because the Bible says, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and him only. Don't miss it. Him only. Him only. So if Jesus is not God, that was the ultimate blasphemy. We're talking about the incarnation of God. If Jesus is not God, that was blasphemy for them to fall down and worship him. But they worshiped him because Jesus is God. The prophecy in Isaiah 9 makes it clear. Verse 6 says, For unto us a child is born. There's his humanity. Unto us a son is given. Who is Jesus? We read it here just a few moments ago. The only begotten son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath revealed him. Jesus Christ is the Son prophesied by Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. The government shall be upon his shoulders, and he's the one who will rule forever. He is the King. He's called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. He was not only born a King, he was God in human flesh. Indeed, they were wise men, weren't they? Now, we don't know exactly how much they really understood, but we know that God led them to bring those specific gifts. God made sure the gifts were recorded in Scripture, and therefore it is significant for us today. So after gold, what shall I bring the Lord Jesus? Because of his sovereign dominion, I give him my wealth. Because of his supreme deity, I give him my worship. My worship. That's continual. You know, the Christmas season comes and goes in a flash. If we're not careful, we'll spend most of our time on our feet, not much time on our face in worship. You know what I mean. We've been busy finding gifts, trimming trees, hanging lights, wrapping presents, moving from one party to another. But how much time in this Christmas season do you spend worshiping Him? Don't spend all your time on your feet. Spend some time on your face, because Jesus is God. The last gift is very significant. So what if God came in the flesh? It would do us no good if not something else didn't happen. The last gift is myrrh. Myrrh speaks of the sacrificial death of our Lord Jesus Christ. What did it symbolize? Like frankincense, myrrh also comes from a certain tree. This is an oily substance which was captured in a little square collecting basin where it hardened into a block. 
It was so expensive in the raw form that they would scrape off shavings for its use. Among other things, it was used as a perfume and a painkiller, but most importantly, it was used for embalming the dead. Can you imagine bringing a newborn baby something that would be used to embalm the dead? Can you imagine bringing a newborn baby what we use today, a bottle of formaldehyde? <laughs> Think of it in those terms. That was what was going on back then. But it was one of the three gifts that were brought by the wise men when they came and bowed before the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, listen to Mark 15, 23. Here Jesus is about to be nailed to the cross and the Bible says that they offered him wine mingled with myrrh, but he did not take it and they crucified him. Wine and myrrh mixed together was an ancient painkiller, but Jesus refused to have it that he might taste suffering and death for every man according to the book of Hebrews on that cross. After his death in John chapter 19, just 18 chapters beyond what we read this morning, we find that Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus, was granted permission to take it. And it says in John 19 verses 39 and 40, And Nicodemus, who at first came to Jesus by night, came also bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pound weight even a little tiny bit of myrrh was so valuable that they would just use scrapings off the little block. He brought a hundred pounds of myrrh and spices to anoint the body of Jesus. Do you think he made a sacrifice for that? Do you think he made a sacrifice for that? I think he did. 100 pounds weight is a lot of myrrh. And they took the body of Jesus and bound it in strips of linen with the spices as the custom of the Jews was to bury. So we read that Joseph and Nicodemus took that myrrh, the aloes, they embalmed the body of Jesus according to the Jewish burial customs, and they used myrrh. The wise men brought myrrh to the Christ child. God guaranteed that there would be certain gifts at his birth. It was no accident. God arranged it to tell us about his son, about who he is, what he came to do. He came to die. Myrrh speaks of his sacrificial death for our sins. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24 tells us Yes, it's not merely the death of Je uh, the birth of Jesus that's important, but he came that he himself might bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead unto sin should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye are healed. You know, we think at Christmas about the Christmas trees, the tree that God was thinking about at Christmas was the cross. That's the tree upon which Jesus was hanged. It wasn't a tree decorated with ornaments. It was a tree stained with his blood. When you think Christmas, think the cross. That's why God set his son. That's why God gave us his best gift. It's a gift that was a sacrifice. When you bring your gifts to God, is it off your surplus or is it out of your sacrifice? God so loved the world that he gave. The proof of your love is the way in which you give. The ones whom you love most are the ones to whom you give most. God gave us his very best. The tree was the cross. Christ's coming was one of two greatest acts of God's grace in all of history. It exchanged a robe of light for a robe of flesh. It exchanged the glory of heaven for a smelly stable, 
a lofty throne for a lowly manger. When you think of the Lord Jesus, think not just the cradle, think the cross. The wise men gave him the gift of myrrh, looking to the day that he would die upon the tree. No wonder heaven's choir came down to sing when heaven's king came down to save. That was his mission. He was born to die for the sins of the world. And so you might ask the question, what shall I give Jesus this Christmas? Well, if you want to parallel those gifts of the wise men, bring him gold. Recognize his sovereign dominion by giving him of your wealth. He's the king of kings. He's the lord of lords. He owns it all, but he only requires a little bit of you because it all belongs to him anyway. He merely wants you to recognize his sovereignty. You're a steward of what he has entrusted to you. Bring him gold. Number two, bring him frankincense. Recognize his supreme deity by giving him your worship. The shepherds bowed, the wise men bowed, the angels bowed, we need to bow. The carol sings, oh, come, let us adore him. Bring him your frankincense. And then finally, bring him myrrh. That speaks of his sacrificial death and how we can respond. We can recognize his sacrificial death by giving him our witness. Let the world know that he died for you. Don't be ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Yesterday I had to go into emergency care. I took a drill and drilled into my hand. That's what this big fat thing here on my finger is. And so I spent my whole afternoon sitting around in an urgent health care center. But you know, I shared Christ with every one of those people that I met in that center. What God had done in my life, the fact that there is a living God, that he loves us, that he cares about me, that he cares about my family, that he's a real God, he's there. Give him your witness. Let them know that there is a sacrifice that will cover their sins. He died for you. It's the cradle to the cross. The cross is the final reason. The cross is a central symbol of Christianity. We thank God for the cradle, the cross, and we thank him for the coming crown. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born, that he died a sacrificial death for your sins, that three days later God raised him from the dead after his death, and that one blessed, glorious day he is coming again. Our wealth, our worship, our witness, they belong to Jesus. Give it to him this Christmas season. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you that our Lord Jesus Christ is indeed God incarnate. All that we have, all that we ever hope to have, all that we are, all that we ever hope to become, our place in history, our time in life, the family, friends, location in which we find ourselves, it has all come as a gracious gift from your hand. You have given to us many gifts. You've given us our breath and our strength and our health. You've given us the freedom that we enjoy, enjoy so much here in this country. You've given us the many possessions and all of us have great wealth compared to the rest of the world we have all from your hand and yet how selfish we are and think of it as our own instead of recognizing that because you are God you are the sovereign over all that we have and we are merely stewards of what you've entrusted to us our time how do we use it our energy what do we expend it on our resources how do we trivialize and waste it? Our opportunities for witness, how often we avoid it. Father, you bought us with the blood of Jesus, an infinitely, infinitely costly price. Now we are yours. Father, bring us under conviction of sin, for we are a people who have wasted much of what you have entrusted to our care. As we've moved through life, we have thought so little about you and so much about ourselves, so much about other people, so much about circumstances, so much about trivia. We confess it as sin. And as we confess it each in our own hearts, your word tells us that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins 
and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And how do you do it? The blood of Jesus Christ, your Son, cleanses us from all sin. The cradle means the cross. The cross means the blood of Christ. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Help us to remember that at Christmas, because you are the God who loved us and gave your Son for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Our closing hymn for today is number 270, Joy to the World.